They paint me as like a narcissistic billionaire, Patrick Bateman, Prometheus, weird dude who's trying to live forever. What do you think it means to be here? Your pictures, you always look um, a little bit too pale, to be honest. I only exist to impress people of the future. Oh my god, then so recently I went to London, right? Ah. So I went to this Harry Potter store and it was the stick. Whoa, like a giant what's that smell? Is it, like is it coming from me? And then I went oh my god, it's to Alison. The How do I tell her? Wow, it's damn paisé though. It's damn rude. I do I just say it? Alison, I think you smell. I wow. Ah, okay, I'm gonna do it. Anyways, ah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last time you wash your clothes? Huh? What you mean? I think you should use one of these the next time you wash your clothes in the washing machine. Oh my god, what are these? It's so pretty and smells so good. These are Breeze laundry capsules. But they're so tiny. They're tiny, but the Breeze laundry capsule is ultra concentrated. So you get 8 times the cleaning power, antibacterial, anti dust mite, and 48 hour anti odor action in every capsule. Oh my god, and it's so aesthetic. It'll make me so happy to do my laundry. Exactly. In fact, I have one more right here. Oh my god! And these are friggin' booster beads that let you have long lasting, amazing smelling clothes for 7 days. Wow, I can't wait to do my laundry tonight as soon as I buy scissors. <laughs> Wait, why do you need scissors? To cut life, not how the thing come out. No, 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 the capsule completely dissolves in water. Come, let me show you. Wow! Oh my god, it dissolves. I can't wait to do my laundry now. That's right. So for the whole month of November, participating Hyper and Silver Markets will be taking turns to do one-for-one -one deals with Breeze Laundry Capsules. Wow. Each capsule is only 30 cents. If you can spend 60 cents on those bubble tea toppings, you surely can spend 30 cents to smell good, look good, and feel good. More details in the description box below. Wow, I need more of this. What would you do if you sold your company for $800 million at the age of 37? Would you buy a private jet, travel the world, or would you try to live forever? Our guest for today is the visionary behind the Blueprint Protocol. Hailing all the way from Los Angeles, California, the 47-year-old man has a biological age of an 18-year-old. Let's welcome Brian Johnson! Wow. One of my bucket welcome, list welcome. guests of all time. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Singapore. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You talked about in quite a few interviews that for 20 years, you've kind of run yourself ragged, right? And yeah. you've gone through chronic depression, obesity, and terrible sleep raising kids while subscribing to this CEO grind culture. And what was it that then got you from there to, I want to live forever? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I guess it stemmed back when I was 21 years old. I, was, I lived in extreme poverty for two years in South America, in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And I was so moved by being present that I came back to the US and I just said, I want to spend my life doing something useful for the human race. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to like, make a whole bunch of money and get a yacht or I didn't want to like just go do some boring job and retire. Like, none of the career paths made sense. I wanted to do something that would help people. In one year's time, I sold my company. I got a divorce. I left my religion and it was this opening. I was 34 years old. And I had this open question, like, what is existence? Mm. Like, I find myself conscious. I didn't ask to be here. I don't recall asking to be here, but I'm here and I'm, I'm alive. What is consciousness? What is, what is existence? And so I was endeavoring to try to answer that question. I spent 10 years <laughs> trying to figure out, like, what does one do when you find yourself to be conscious? So the first thing I did is I started investing in science. Uh, $100 million in synthetic biology, genomics, uh, precision chemistry, nanotech. Mm. So I was trying to figure out like in the trenches of deep science, how what kind of reality can we build? And then I built a brain interface company. So we built uh, a wearable. So fMRI is like a gold standard measurement system, but it's big and it's a few million dollars. We built basically fMRI just in a bike helmet. So right. we put that in seven years. And then all the while I was trying to piece together, uh, like I just was ruminating on this question, like again and again, like what is this moment? And the 25th century thought experiment was like, mm. ah, like that's, that's what this moment is. And so once that thought finally came to you, what exactly is the first step? Like where do you go to begin this journey? Uh, so I was, I was with my uh, coworker, Kate Tolo, who's here with us today. And we were, um, <laughs> yeah, we were building this brain interface company. And basically we, we wondered, like, what if I tried to become the most don't die person in human history? 
Okay. Like, like, what would that look like? Because like we could see the idea was correct, but how do you explain this yeah. Yeah. in any understandable way? So to do that, you'd have to measure every organ of the entire body. Then we applied the best science and um, basically like you have to make this understandable. Like this means going to bed on time. It means exercising every day. It means like saying no to friends. If they say, come out and drink and we're going to party all night and like YOLO, mm -hmm. like you're being boring. Like just you're, we live in this world of die culture. So how can you actually uh, be don't die in every way of life? So when you make such a radical change, and I think like you said, you have to set very firm boundaries with your friends and all this. How did this affect your personal relationships? At first, I think my friends were pretty confused. <laughs> yeah. As they should be. Yeah. I mean, like all of society is die right now, right? Like basically- <laughs> The way he thinks is just strange, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what really makes you question what are we doing? Okay, sorry, please uh, go yeah, on. Yeah, mm. It's like, um, but you think about like, what do we do for fun? It's slow boil suicide. Yeah. Like Ooh. we drink, we smoke, we stay out late. Uh, like we eat junk food and we, we call these things fun. We're like, this is what living life means. This is mm. like how we, but all of our activities are basically die. <laughs> and, but we don't see it that way. We, we yeah. glorify it. And it's like, and so if someone doesn't do it, it's like, well, you're a lame person. Like, why are you not doing the slow boil suicide mm. thing? Mm -mm. Can you tell us what a day in your life looks like? Uh, I do about 100 things in any given day. I try to make my entire life structured like a big science experiment. So I go to bed at exactly 8.30 p.m. I wake okay. up naturally at 5 a.m. When I wake up, I start a sequence of therapies. So I'll take my temperature in my ear. I'll weigh myself. I get my fat, muscle, hydration. I'll do a therapy on my uh, left tragus for my HRV. Um, and then I just do like, a series of things all morning long. So the right. first four hours of my day is just one continuous routine. So when people Google you, right, I think one of the first things that pop up is that you take more than 100 pills a day, you're having your, all your meals are done by 11 a.m. and then you have very strict routines right before you sleep also. So what is it, what is the mission behind the Blueprint Protocol that would make someone commit to this? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's really a thought experiment. So uh, first, <laughs> yeah. that went way too far. <laughs> so like imagine, okay, so let's, let's imagine we can whisper into the ears of someone who lives in the year 1870. Mm -hmm. What could we tell them about the future that would help them? And so we'd say, hey, psst, there are these new ideas about these microscopic objects. They're called germs. Mm. And if you, if you get them, they can lead to infection and maybe even kill you. And they'll say, I don't believe you. That's right. Mm. That doesn't exist. That's stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like if my eyes can't see it, I don't believe it. But if you're open-minded, mm. you may say, okay, what is true right now that is actually present, but we just can't quite see it yet or that we think is stupid? Yeah. So the question is, if the 25th century, so a few hundred years into the future, could whisper into our ears, what would they say? Okay, okay. And how did you boil it down to this? Um, I think the 25th century would say, this is the moment when Homo sapiens, that's us, figured out that we were transitioning as a, of a, spe as a species from death being inevitable to being able to extend our lifespans to some unknown horizon. So this doesn't mean that we have immortality. It just means the technology is here to extend our lives one year, two years, three years, and more and more and more. And then we realize that if death is not inevitable, that we're going to live on some unknown extension, mm -hmm. we change everything about existence to prioritize not dying as the primary virtue of, of being humans. So like the whole idea is we measured every organ in my body trying to get the biological age. So let's say like I'm 47 chronologically, but my heart is 37. Mm. Okay. So the question is, how can you make my heart 36 and then 35 and 34? And so everything we do throughout the entire day is trying to slow down my speed of aging or reverse the aging damage. Mm. What, so, what do you mean by biological age of 37? So for example, does it, does it mean that your organ or your heart in, the, in this case perform at, at a 37 year old level? Or are we looking at the longevity of the organ currently at yeah. 37 year old? Great question. So. Uh, you can age an organ according to its functional characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, or you can uh, do also through anatomical. So you can say, like, so, you know, like a, a, a heart of a 10-year-old 
looks different than a heart of an 80 year old. Right. Like different cells, like different cell structure, uh, different functional tissue. And so you can actually age according to the structural dynamics, the age of an organ, the pancreas, the liver, the heart, the lungs, like any organ. And then functionally, how does it work? You know, does it mm. work like a 10 year old or an 80 year old? So you can tease out all those components and then age. So for exa- example, the heart, you could, you, you could have like a few, like a dozen age markers. Mm. You can, you can score the max heart rate. You can score mm. the aorta. You can score, you know, plaques. So did you figure out most of this scoring by yourself or what were, were this already standard measurements for the heart? Yeah. So we just looked at the scientific literature. Okay. And so we'd find these age reference ranges and say hearts that look and function like this are this age. Right. And then we applied that model to my entire body to say, what is the age? Like, for example, my, my left ear is 64. Oh, because I, ha- because so I have, because I have 81 decibel sleep. Yeah. So as a kid, I listened to loud music right, and right, I also right. shot a lot of guns. Mm. And because I'm right-handed, I'd, ho- I'd hold a gun like this. So my left ear was exposed to the, the sound of the gunshot, mm. but my right ear was more protected. Mm. So this ear is 64, this ear is like 41. What is the success rate of like, when, when, when people try this, like for example, like the br- blueprint stack, right? Do you know, do you, are you measuring like the success rate of adoption? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we have data now on a large cohort of people. Um, yeah. So we had, I, if I remember correctly, it was something like uh, nearly 40% decrease in depression symptoms. Wow. wow. Nearly 35% decrease in anxiety symptoms. Right. Um, it was a uh, increase in musculoskeletal. It was an increase in sleep quality, increase in uh, muscle mass, like just across the board. Mm. Uh, it was of incre- improved liver markers. So yeah, pretty, uh, pretty compelling data. Like. We went through, we tried to build the most evidence-based protocol in history, like the yeah. most scientific evidence, and we packed it all together. It was kind of a crazy thing to do, and it worked. So mm-hmm. I think it's really the best thing that's ever been built, and the data shows it. Right. Okay. What was the hardest thing for you personally to like kind of like unlearn from your old lifestyle? Uh, I used to overeat a lot. Yeah. Mm. And so getting myself to a situation where, like it's so hard to not overeat. You're like you, you're in that moment and the food's in front of you, and like your willpower is the only thing separating you between that. Mm. And so getting to a point where I'm actually okay not overeating and actually don't want to do it, that was the hardest thing. Right. So what was the actual duration that it took you to get to where you're at and adjust to your, your current lifestyle? Probably two years. Oh. Yeah, where like I, I legitimately, uh, I can't, it's, it's so hard for me to, comp- to imagine eating certain kinds of foods or eating too much, I would feel so sick mm. it'd, it'd be so bad. Mm. Whereas before it was like this really weird relationship where like you, you didn't want to do you, you didn't want to do it. So you're resisting then you did it and then you regret it. Mm. Uh, right. It's like, but like you still do it. Relatable. And you do it, and you do it all the time. <laughs> you can't stop yourself. So now I know that if I do it, I'm going to be so sick. I'm going to just hate it, hate it. So it's no longer, I don't want it anymore. So when was the last time you had a craving? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, 1990. So weirdly, I don't crave things anymore wow. uh, be- because like I know I've done this so many times. I know it produces sadness mm. every interesting, single interesting. time. Yeah. It produces, like, never in my entire life have I done it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm so glad I did it. It was just immediate regret. Mm. So yeah. But looking at, at the way you live your life, it just, uh, it, it feels tough. I think even if you gave me all the pills and all the tests and the routine, I still probably wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. At which point do you think this talk experiment, you're going to call it a day and <laughs> feel, okay. <laughs> I've yeah. got the results I need. It was fun to know I'm yeah. 52 now, let's live. Yeah. No, let's die. Yeah, let's die. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is the probability that your reasoning could be backwards? That my existence is actually meaningfully better. I do yeah. feel like the probability is non-zero. <laughs> so you wouldn't need to live like I live. Just the, the basics would work. So if, okay. if you went to bed on time. Any side, time, but on time. Yeah, just on time. You choose okay. your time. Okay. And just be in bed asleep within 30 minutes of that every night. Okay. And then exercise every day for 30 minutes. Okay. Try to eat a good diet. It doesn't have to be perfect. And then avoid the bad stuff and just do those things, like that's the majority of the benefit. 
Right. So because you control so all almost every aspect of your life, right? Do you have free time? Yeah. And so I have more free time. Okay. So this is this is the thing, is like That's true. most people they assume I'm miserable. They mm. assume I have no time. They mm. assume my life sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is so funny is it's exactly the opposite. I'm happier than I've ever been. I have more time than I ever have. There's not, I'm it's not true. suffering. I, actually, I'm really happy. I'm I'm in a great situation. So what do you like to do in your free time? Um, therapies. Con- more experimentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, more experimentation. Then what, what is something that brings you joy that is not about a therapy or an optimization? My son and I play a lot of sports together. Mm. Right. Yeah, we go, uh, we do a lot of hiking. A couple of months ago, we did a three day mountain biking trip in the desert. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So we rode our bikes all day long. Uh, we, I think we did like 60 miles. We just generally do what we want to do. We, mm-hmm. you know, we race cars, we go bowling, we go golfing. <laughs> you know, it's just like- Yeah, that, does your son do the same routine as you daily? Yeah. Right. When did he get on board this? Uh, 16. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, so this is the cool thing. It's like, gonna leave till 200 at least. Yeah, because a lot of people, they'll like, they see friends in their 20s or whatever. They're like, why are you being healthy? Like. You don't need to be, but actually, so he started at 16, but people now are starting don't die before they're conceived. So oh. people are doing embryo selection, right? Mm. Basically humans are practicing don't die right. before conception. Is it ever too late to start on this protocol? Like say if, I, if I'm 80 years old right now, right? Can I start this and then I will live to 120? You, yeah. So my dad is a good example about this. So my dad's 71, mm. but if he, he if he inputs his data into a health, uh, basically an online life estimator, like the same ones the insurance companies use mm. that predicts death and they're very good. Really? Okay. They're very good. Um, <laughs> his predicted death is 68. Oh. Ooh, so okay. he's past due. Right. Like so, can you can you imagine, uh, like living, and you know you're past due, and when you go to sleep, hmm. like I admire my dad. I admire anyone in that kind of state. <laughs> That's tough. Like hmm. you don't know. Like every like when you call your your loved ones, like is that the last time you're gonna talk to them? And like you better like hmm. you know tell them you hmm. love them and you appreciate them and like it's been an amazing life together. But like my dad, even though he's in this circumstance, he fights for life with this vigor that's so inspiring. So I'd say, yeah, anyone in any circumstance, I think should fight uh, with their best efforts because we're at a different time of being humans. Like if if this were like the 1920s, like you're gonna die, <laughs> right? But now like we just don't know, like no one knows how fast that things will develop. I think you've shared in previous interviews that you used to care a lot about how people perceive you, so what you look like and all that. Do you still have an insecurity now? No. So it's funny, uh, a documentary was shot uh, over the past year. Okay. And it will be released this, in uh, this January. And I, I view myself on camera and I'm like, oh my God, why didn't someone say anything to me? Like, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Where are all your friends? Where are my <laughs> friends? Like, <laughs> We just went all in, like just no holes barred. And um, I can see what people are saying on how I look. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I get it. <laughs> no, you look a lot more colorful in person. Yeah, you, you look a lot healthier in person. Your pictures, you always look um a little bit too pale, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, I'm like, like too pale and like a too much, too a whole bunch of other stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I watched the doc and I was like, oh man, like, I get it now. I, I see what people are saying. <laughs> 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 but like, <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. I forgot. But where that we're going doesn't get to you. Yeah, no, so like um, <clears throat> the thing that I always keep in mind is uh, you realize that the opinions that people expressed of that time and place, no one cares about anymore. Mm. They only care about the ideas that traveled through time and persisted. Mm. But like the the naysayers, like they're gone. Mm. Um, and so I don't care about anyone's opinion of me who lives right now because the majority of these opinions represent the past. I only care about the opinions of those who exist in the 25th century. I'm, I only exist to impress people of the future. And if I can pass that bar, then basically I will have personally felt like I achieved a goal of doing something useful for the human race. But if, mm. you, peg your, if you peg yourself to the moment, you're gonna be held back because that's the past holding you back to the norms and the status quo that were not what will be. And so in that regard, 
Yeah, I really genuinely do not care what people say about me in this moment. Impressive. <laughs> How big is the team behind all of your therapy operations? If you include all the doctors, there are probably 30, 30 people total. Wow, wow. okay. That's that our entire company here. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah like some people, they're just like, they're part-time. They might be like a world expert in the heart. Right. Wow. One might be a world expert in the lungs. One's, you know, like, so we, we try to bring all these expertise, all this expertise in as a big team. Mm. Because it's such, you know, like in any given domain, you have to master this enormous body of knowledge, right? So no one can play across the spectrum. Have you, so the, I would think the medical community is extremely excited or interested in what you're doing. Have you faced any resistance from, you know, when we talk about big pharma doesn't want you to live forever? Or do yeah, you? I'm probably the most hated person <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by the medical establishment, like by many. I'm really inconvenient to exist in someone's life, like for many of these people. Mm. Um, like have, have they tried to stop you? They they try to discredit me. Mm. Yeah, like, you know, like I, uh, they paint me as like a, a, a uh, reckless character that shouldn't be seen as anything legitimate. Right. Yeah, not everyone, like, but like definitely there's just friction. Like some people fully embrace it. Mm. I never would have imagined that this would have generated like the global discussion it did. Like yeah. it's insane, mm. uh, the, the proportion of the response. And so it's just been everything, the good and the bad, but like majority has been like uh, a knee jerk reaction of um, like disapproval or dislike or, you know, something to that nature. From who, largely the medical community? I, not, I wouldn't even isolate them. I just like generally speaking, like just like, Really? Um, yeah, like I think most people, um, it's like the headlines. It's like this narcissistic billionaire Patrick Bateman, Prometheus, <laughs> Dorian Gray, <laughs> billionaire weird dude, you know, who's trying to live forever. Now I understand, like the headlines it generates clicks and stuff like that, but I'm definitely painted as this um, villain-like character. Right. Right. One criticism that I have heard is also that people are questioning, what are you actually getting out of this? Because you are spending millions of dollars every year to test yourself and going through all of this. And then after that, I'm saying, I'm going to give it away for free. And people yeah. struggle to wrap their head around that. Yeah. Mm. How would you respond to these people? I understand the skepticism. Yeah, so this was the goal I had when I was 21, is I wanted to make a whole bunch of money and then do something meaningful in the world. Mm. I made that money <laughs> and it's like, lucky me it happened. Yeah. And so now like, I, I'm genuinely trying to make a positive contribution to the world. Mm. And uh, like, it's, it's such a small thing for me. Like, uh, why would I hold it back? Mm. Like it's silly mm. when like, it can benefit so many people. So it's, I understand this, the skepticism, but like it's just- um, it's, you, you don't need more money. I don't need more money, yeah. Mm. yeah. Are you optimistic about your lifespan? Yes. What, what's the number in your head? Well, so first of all, I'm going to die because irony hunts me, right? I'm going to be, I'm going to get hit by a bus. Okay. And it's going to be the funniest thing in the whole world. And it's going to be my gift to humanity. <laughs> so when it happens, Likely. I give you permission to have fun with it. <laughs> Thank you. Keep this, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep this clip. Yeah. And so, but I mean, absent that happening, then yes, I, I think this is the first time in the history of the human race where somebody can say with a straight face, they may not die. So it's, it's just such a sobering and cool moment. It's here, like the future has arrived. Like this recent study, uh, this recent group I know, they just took a mouse in the last uh, weeks of their life and doubled their life expectancy by using this epigenetic reprogramming. So it's wow. really, it's hitting on all these levels for all of us. I'm quite curious because I think a lot of people talk about life having, in a sense, value because it is finite. Yeah. So what you're essentially proposing is against that. And there are people that can construe this as an extreme case of death phobia, right? Yeah. Would you say you're afraid of dying? Uh, no, uh, I'm not afraid of dying. When you talk about life, so many people want to defend death. Mm. True. Uh, so many people, right? It, it really surprised me, but... But people have such clever arguments. They'll say something like, you know, it it gives a new generation of people mm. the ability to you know do their thing, and, mm. and old people can't stop them from doing that. It creates renewal. Um, it's the way we pass on our genes through our children. Like they they come up with all these arguments, and it's just like um, you could imagine a point in the future where death 
is not like no one's going to defend death ever for any reason. Mm. Right. And they would look back like the 21st century may look back and be like, can you believe those people? Like yeah, they, yeah. like they were making all these elegant arguments on like why death was a good thing. And mm. it'd be so incomprehensible. And so, yeah, it's like maybe in this moment we have norms that we make these arguments, but to the future, they just may be crazy. And we haven't evolved past death. Yeah. <laughs> I read this quote recently about how, um, if aliens were to visit the earth and then they, they send someone to come and wreck you and, and check whether we are intelligent and one of them would go back and say no. He say, why is it? Do they not have weapons? And they say they do, but they all point it at themselves. Mm. Yeah. 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 That kind of stuff. If right now I tell you, right, for some strange reason, you only have a year left to live. Yeah. What would you spend that year doing? Mm. I would do exactly what I'm doing. But you wouldn't go ham. Like you, try, <laughs> you, try, you try everything yeah. that you've, you know, yeah, yeah. maybe a bit dangerous to try. Yeah. Like at 3 a.m. <laughs> yeah, no. I really am into this. Mm. I think it's right. Yeah. I think it's correct. Um, I think it's like the coolest thing we can do as a species. We think of life as like what we mentioned just now is finite. And I think this was a question that I, we have a Telegram community and we I took a poll this morning asking if in an ideal world, so you have perfect physical and mental health, how old would you want to live? Yeah. How long would you want to live? So the options that I gave were 80 to 100, yeah. more than 100 forever. And a lot of people struggled with picking forever because they felt like, okay, maybe living till 200 would be enough time to do what I want to do. And anything beyond that would yeah. be, you yeah. know, I'm bored. I, what what yeah. else is there left yeah. to do? And so yeah. people struggle to wrap their mind around that. And the second thing is that a big question that people asked was, what about my loved ones? Yes. Are they also living as long as I am? And so for yourself, right? I think now that you mentioned that your son is also on this journey with you, right? Do you think that makes a big difference for you? It does. Yeah, but you know, like to your point, mm. so I, I never talk about living forever because it breaks people's brains, <laughs> right? Yes. Like, like, like the human mind, like it tries to compute. And it's mm. like, I need to shut down. Mm. Mm. And like, so the question is like, do you want to live tomorrow? Like, do you want to mm. live tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Do you want to live tomorrow's tomorrow? Yes, for now. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so here's the thing, living for tomorrow and living forever are identical ideas. They mm. are the same concept. You always want to have a tomorrow. Right, right, yeah, right. Like you live forever. Like it's like you can't compute, but we mm. all understand what living tomorrow means. So it's the same idea. It's just like it shows that the human brain is incapable of calculating mm. some time span that is not t tomorrow yeah. and therefore it just shuts down. So it's just a good reminder that many things our brains try to do they just fail at, um, but yeah, and we don't realize the brain failed us. Mm. We think it's actually the answer. Mm. Also, I think when people think about having to live forever, then retirement never comes. I'm working forever. <laughs> yeah. uh, that and is a comment people make. Uh, that is extremely <laughs> tiresome. Uh, people ask, yeah. how's my financial health yeah. in this yeah. ideal yeah. world? And then I'm curious for yourself, right? What do you think it means to be human? As you might guess, what I'm gonna say is a thought experiment. Okay. Okay. So like we we travel back in time and we're with Homo erectus a million years ago. Mm. Okay. So like state of play is they have an ax as the leading technology of the day is an ax. Okay. And so let's just say we, we, we want to start up a conversation and like warm things up. So we're like, Hey, Homo erectus, how's it going? We have three questions for you. you mm. know, I need to know where food is because I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. I also want to know where water is. I'm thirsty. And I want to know where, I, where there's danger. Like, where do I, where should I avoid? Mm -hmm. Now, Homo erectus probably knows these things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to trust their knowledge. We're traveling in time. And now we say, all right, now we're going to get fun and we're going like, to mix this up. Homo erectus, tell us about the future of intelligent existence. Like, tell us about the future of the species. Go. So the question is, like, the contemplation is, are we potentially homo erectus in this moment? Yeah. Like mm. we're giving birth to AI. AI is going to be so far superior to us. It's going to be like not even comparable. Mm. And so when we try to say something intelligent about existence, are we not homo erectus? Like, is it just like laughable how little we mm. know and how primitive we are mm -hmm. and how in the future we look back and be like, we knew like, that's so ridiculous. Our yeah. ideas about what it meant to be human or existence. Like, so 
I think, yeah, I think we're extremely primitive. Mm -hmm. I think our ideas about reality are like, just like juvenile mm -hmm. and like they're going to change. And so I, I actually, I'm here for it. I'm here to like move into this future where we can't even imagine what's going to happen. Mm. I'm completely sold. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm speaking to a Martian. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that your willpower is above average? Um, I try to never rely upon my willpower. Right. So oh. basically like if, so you say, all right, I'm going to make a goal. I'm not going to have the cookies at dinner. Mm. Right. Dinner arrives, the cookies are there, and you can make a decision. Right. Mm. The chance you're going to eat the cookies, the probability is very high. Versus if you just like don't even give yourself the option, like you're not going to eat the cookies at all. And so I basically try to build life systems where I never have to make a decision about anything. Oh. Right. Like just never give yourself the option. Interesting. I could get behind it, I would think. To not, not have to think, then yeah. you don't decide. What then makes us human if I don't decide anything in my life, you know? This is the kind of stuff we get into with these don't die conversations. Like your point was good. You said basically, if I'm not making these choices, what does it mean to be human? Mm. Mm. Right? So like your identity is like, I am a hu conscious human. I make these decisions. I do this thing. If I don't do this thing, I don't know why I exist. Mm. Mm. And so this is why people, when they, when we walk through these ideas, there's so many of those kinds of examples where it just, it, it makes you question your reality and you're kind of like, ah, well, that takes all the fun out of existence. Mm. So good news for you is like, yes. as we work through this, this conversation, you would warm up to the ideas at the very end. You would feel this, I think, this new vibrancy for life that life could be magically different mm. like in ways that are inconceivable to you now. Mm. And you would be just as happy, if not happier. Mm. What do you think is the most fascinating thing you've learned about yourself? So not about any of the therapies that you've done, right? But about yourself mm. as a person through the past 10 years. Like medically? No. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I would say um, we all have aspirations for life. Like I guess I, I really appreciate that I, I'm, I'm alive. I really value existence. I don't know what it's like to be dead. <laughs> you know, but like, Same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like really cool to be alive, and I find it to be inspiring to imagine like what could existence become. Mm. So like if I'm Homo erectus right now, and I'm trying to like say anything intelligent about existence, like the only thing I think I can say is that it's probably bigger and more expansive than my mind can comprehend. Yep. And I'm here for it. Okay, so a big thank you to Brian Johnson for joining us today. I hope you've learned a lot and expanded your minds as we have. Like, share, subscribe, leave your comments down below and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. I, I have my last meal today at 11 a.m. normally. So are you hungry right now? I'm fine right now. Really? Yeah. Really do? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ate something at four, I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs>